Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're discussing a site that covers streaming TV and attracts millions of visitors a month. Over the past year, dozens of writers have left their mainstream media jobs to launch their own standalone newsletters and publications. In almost every case, the writer monetized his content through paid subscriptions, usually with a tool like Substack. Rick Ellis never bothered with paid subscriptions. Instead, his website allyourscreens.com generates so much traffic each month that he's able to make a good living mostly through programmatic advertising. Ellis has been operating allyourscreens.com on and off since the early 2000s, but a few years ago he decided to abandon traditional media completely to focus on the site full time. I recently interviewed him about how he found his audience, what his weekly writing schedule looks like, and why he has no interest in building out a paid subscription business. Before we jump into the interview, I want to talk about something I recently published to my Substack newsletter. I interviewed Tegan Goddard, the founder of Political Wire, which has been one of the leading political news sites stretching back to 1999. We discussed how he built his initial business model through advertising and how he expanded into paid memberships about a half decade ago. It's crucial reading for anyone wanting to build a paid membership business, and the only way to receive articles like it is to go to simonowens.substack.com and sign up. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or you can just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, now on to my interview with Rick. Hey, Rick, thanks for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, So you have this great website focused on streaming TV, uh, but you actually had a pretty circuitous path leading up to the launch to it, right? Like back in the 90s, you did everything from stand-up comedy to radio. Tell me a little bit about your career kind of prior to launching the site. (laughs) Yeah, I I had a headhunter once describe my uh, my resume as eclectic, which I I think is probably pretty accurate. Uh, I spent most of my 20s doing stand-up comedy. I was always writing on the side, uh, doing freelance pieces. But uh, at one point after about 10 or 12 years, I I transitioned to talk radio. I did syndicated talk radio for three or four years. And by the late 90s, I was in the Bay Area working at a startup, uh, a financial news startup. And um, it was all audio and video. And I was still doing writing on the side, uh, both for other online sites and I had started one of my own that was basically just a place to sort of archive things that I either wanted to do on myself or or things that uh, freelance pieces I'd done for other people. And uh, that was sort of the start of this website. It, it's uh, and it really all through the the aughts, I was working on and off for big media companies. And I would use this website as as a place to archive stuff. And when I would get laid off, I would spend all of my attention on the website for the whatever six months or a year till I got another full-time job. And typically when I got a full-time job, they would say, you can't do your website anymore. So it would kind of go back off to the side. And stand-up comedy, that's from what I've heard is a pretty brutal career, right? In terms of travel and kind of late nights and stuff like that. Was the transition to talk radio, like almost kind of taking your comedic personality and putting it on the radio? Like, was that kind of the, the thinking there? You know, honestly, I wish I could say it was more, it was that planned. Uh, the, the truth was that I'd been doing it for 10 or 11 years, and my mom was living in Arizona. She got sick, and I went to take care of her. And so I took time off the road, and I, I didn't do stand-up for about a year and a half. And at that point, the thought of going back out on the road was just more than I could deal with. And I was lucky someone locally offered me a, a job doing radio, and that turned into an entirely different career. I mean, it is sort of a lot of the same still, uh, skill set, but it, it wasn't nearly as planned as I wish I could claim it was. What was the focus of the radio show? Uh, they were pitching it as uh, essentially Howard Stern without the, the rudeness of a uh, morning zoo throughout the day kind of thing and uh, it was actually an interesting idea we did pretty well with it they were they were syndicating the, the 12 hours a day out of phoenix uh unfortunately for them they were doing it just as the radio industry was starting to consolidate so they were constantly in a situation of they'd get affiliates six months later the affiliates would be bought by what was then clear channel they had all flipped a rush limbo and all this stuff and then they have to find stations again and at some point they just realized this just wasn't going to be viable uh but the stations that had it really enjoyed it a lot it was a lot of fun and so then you went to media startups you went to various like media companies but you started this uh you started this website 
And was it like a blog? Like, was it in the early day? day were you using like blogging software? What was what was kind of the setup of it? Well, I started uh, long enough ago that I was using Blogger and uh, GeoCities. Actually, it was the first website I had. So I'm really old. Uh, but I pretty early on, I had my own domain, which really was actually an issue. Um, because back then, if you had your own domain, you had to pay for bandwidth. And the problem I would run into is if I wrote something people really read, it would cost me money. Um, maybe 2003, I wrote a bunch of pieces about Phil Donahue le- leaving MSNBC and it got tons of traffic. It ended up costing me three or $400 to write the piece. Uh, paying for bandwidth, wow. which really yeah. isn't a sustainable model if you're <laughs> trying to live. So uh, that was part yeah, of the reason. Like, <laughs> part of the reason I didn't do it more back then was it just it just wasn't a sustainable kind of thing. That's why everyone was using Blogger because you just yeah. couldn't afford it otherwise. Yeah, I seem to remember that too. Like I had an early blog, and some so and like some pieces would go really viral, and then like I would get some email from my hosting company saying like you're you're almost at your limit or you're going over your limit and i remember the web like i'd make it under the front page of dig and it would just crash the website whereas i feel like today um hosting is a lot simpler right like you just set it up on wordpress or squarespace you pay some amount and there's not really like those kinds of limits right no and i have a little bit more robust setup just because of the, the amount of traffic i have like i have my own server through a web host and, and, and all that, but it's still the, the cost is really minimal, uh, particularly compared to what it would have cost me 10 or 15 years ago. And, and it's just so much easier now to do it. Really the, that is the least challenging part of what I do is the, the technical side of it. Yeah. And so the, the, the first site that you, uh, you created was called something like all your TV, right? Right. I'd called it all your TV and I had that domain through uh, up until about 10 years ago. And at some point I decided, well, look, TV's changing. I want to re- write about stuff that isn't just specifically about broadcast television. So I got the, the idea of changing it to all your screens, which is sort of a mixed bag. It's more complicated for people to remember. It is all also m- more representative of what I do. So it's it's a bit of a mixed bag uh, that way, but uh, I think it fits my mission statement a little better. And like, why TV? Like, was this something you were kind of obsessed with? You know, were you a heavy TV watcher? Did you want to be like a TV critic? Like, what? How did this fit into like your passion? You know, once again, I, I wish I could claim it was some really great uh, plan. I when I was doing stand up, I hardly ever watched television because obviously I was working. And when I was doing talk radio, I used CompuServe a lot to get uh, show prep. And I started hanging out at a, an entertainment forum that was on CompuServe. And they eventually offered me uh, some freelance work on the side. And I just sort of backed into it. I really loved the industry. I knew a lot of people in the industry uh, from doing stand-up. You know, I have all kinds of buddies who are, who are working in the, the industry still. So I was really – I had an interest in it. And the more I got into it, it's it was a really good fit for my skill set because I didn't stand up. I sort of understand the creative side of it a lot more than than the typical critic would. Um, so it, it it's just one of those things. I I guess I always had a latent interest in it, but just didn't realize it till till I started writing about it. And what did it look like in those early days? Like, what kind of coverage were? What were you covering? Were you just reviewing TV, or what was the what? How was your? How were you approaching it? <laughs> Back then, I was just writing about what I was interested in. And the one big difference between now and then is because it was so novel, I would frequently write about a show and have someone reach out to me and say, hey, I, I'm, i you know, I'm the writer for the show or I'm the creator for the show or I'm the star of the show. I'd like to talk to you because it was just one of those things that there wasn't a lot of people doing it. Now, of course, there's 50 million people writing about television and it, it's a much different uh environment all the way around and uh but you would get how did you build the initial you said that you'd have some like really heavy traffic months how did you build that audience how did people find you back then because this is this is kind of free pre-social media right yeah it was pre-social media a lot of it was search engine a lot of it was people who would stumble across the website for whatever reason and then would just start following it i mean i because it was always a side thing i really didn't 
uh, spend a lot of time promoting it. You know, it was always, it wasn't my primary way of making money back then. And I was always surprised when people would pay attention to it. It, it, I remember at one point, actually the, the Phil Donahue pieces, I was going back and forth an email with a publicist and she said, Oh, congratulations. And I, well, why? She says, Oh, well, you got mentioned in Vanity Fair this week or this month. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I honestly had no idea. <laughs> I was like, Oh, oh, well, <laughs> it was all part of my plan, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned that it was kind of like a side gig. Some employers wouldn't even let you run it. But when they did, were you just kind of running it on your nights and weekends, like just writing late into the night? Yeah, I, I would use it as spare time. I mean, it depended on the employer. Uh, some of them tolerated as long as it didn't get in the way of my normal job and I didn't mention who I was working for. I mean, on the other hand, I, I did one of my last full-time jobs was working for AOL and or division of AOL, and they threatened to fire me once they found I was writing about television because their attitude was, we own Huffington Post. Huffington Post writes about television, so you're competing with us. Wow. So we should. Yeah, which seems a little crazy on the, the face of it, but it, it gives you an idea of how difficult sometimes it was to juggle both of those things. Were you working on AOL's media side then? No, not at all. Actually, I was working as an editor for their, their patch sites. Mm-hmm. So, you <laughs> so, were, I mean, so, so you were working on media, like journalism type yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, I mean, for quite, uh, excuse me, for quite a few years, I worked for a company that was based in in St. Paul here uh, that ran websites for uh, network affiliates for for various TV stations. So, I mean, I, uh, I worked both as a local editor, and then I worked at their national news desk. So it was media, uh, not traditional media, I guess, but uh, definitely regular media and hard news media at, at that. So. Uh huh. And so, how did you end up deciding to focus on your website, which you eventually changed to all your screens? How did you end up start to decide to focus on that full time? Well, uh, probably eight years ago, nine years ago, I went through a spell where I, I was laid off three times in two years, and I was going into my fifties, and it was just a situation of really having to think about what's your future. And I knew it was going to be difficult being hired by somebody there. Yeah, you know, there is a lot of ageism, whether people want to admit it or not. And also just the fact that I was in the I was living in Minnesota. I liked living here. Uh, the education was really good for my kid. I didn't want to move. And if I was going to get a job somewhere, I was going to have to move to New York or Atlanta. And if if I didn't want to do that and there weren't jobs here, I had to figure out some other option. And I started out freelancing and working on my website and over the several three, four year period, it evolved from mostly freelance to all on my website. And that's what I've been doing in the years since. And so you start, you start focusing it on full time. Did you like, so what was your kind of strategy? Like, you're just like, I'm going to throw everything, you know, or I would throw everything in my free time when I'm not freelancing at it. And then just like, once it reached kind of like a critical point, I could make the switch to working on it full time. Yeah, it really was uh, just as much time as possible trying to make as many connections as possible, doing as much work. One advantage I had was that because I was a little older and I had a little bit more experience, I had connections that I could draw on. Uh, If I was 25 as opposed to at that point, you know, whatever, mid 50s, I wouldn't have known different people to call it to get interviews, to get news. And it was just a matter of just buckling down and hoping I can write some stuff that would uh, encourage people to work with me in the future. And so eight or nine years ago, that's just like right at the, sort of the beginning of when, you know, Netflix starts ramping up its original content and then a lot of other companies, um, you know, start following. I've heard that the, it, it almost acted as kind of like a huge influx like obviously there's just so much premium content out there. Plus that was like the, when Facebook started trying to get into content in the sense of like sending a lot of traffic to news sites, was that like kind of the perfect time for you to catch that, catch that wave as everything was kind of like rising, especially in the TV space? Yeah. I mean, when there's that much stuff, people need uh, some voices, trusted voices that can, highlight stuff for them that can say, Hey, look, I know everyone's talking about Westworld, but there's these eight shows that are really good. You might not know about these are ones you should pay attention to. It's it's the way I describe it is 
almost back in the old days when uh, there were video store clerks and you would go in and, you know, E.T. was rented and you would think, OK, I need to watch something. And the, the clerk would say, well, if you like E.T., maybe you should try this. It's a, it's a smaller movie, and but it's sort of similar. And that's really over the months, over the years, that's what my job has sort of evolved into is being that voice that can kind of cut through the clutter. And I was a big fan of, of Netflix really going into this. I had interviewed the CEO of Netflix back in the late nineties when they were still just distributing DVDs out of a one warehouse in San Francisco. And back then he was, had this whole vision he'd lay out about one day people are going to watch movies on the internet, blah, blah, blah. This was a time when really most people had dial up and it just was such a fanciful idea, but it gave me a, a real idea of where their ambitions were. And uh, so I always kept that in mind. I think this is where the world's going and let me see if I can figure out a way to take advantage of it. And so talk to me about like what your typical work week looks like in terms of what you're producing on a weekly basis. Like I seem to remember you write an incredibly high number of words each week. Like I write in a really good week, I'm maybe writing 5,000 words for my newsletter. What's your kind of like really high word count typical week? I figured out for 2020, and this is sort of an estimate because I wasn't tracking it as I went along. I sort of went back and tried to figure it out that I was averaging somewhere in the range of 55, 60,000 words. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, (laughs) Which is just it's a crazy amount. And look, I'm the first person to admit it's not all Shakespearean quality stuff. A lot of it's news items. A lot of it's, Hey, look, this show's coming. Yeah. Here's just the details, but there's also some, I think really good interviews, really good insight in there. And it's, it's really a mix yeah. uh, of different things from goofball stuff to, to hard news, to think pieces about the, the future of streaming television, but it, it's a lot every week. Yeah. And there's just so much like, especially if you're getting to the aggregation game, which I think you're in, like there's so many trailers launched each week, so many announcements about casting or this is getting renewed stuff like that. Like, that's just like, you know, gets people excited for, you know, like for instance, like it was trending yesterday that Michael Keaton was going to be the new Batman or it just like, just constantly new stuff like that. Plus celebrities are always doing something that might be related to the shows they're on. So what's the kind of balance you're trying to strike between aggregating news, doing original reporting, and then doing reviews of TV shows. Like you're actually watching shows, right. And doing like, I don't know, re reviews, uh, recaps, creating guides, of the best movies to watch of the year. What's kind of that balance that you're trying to strike? Um, it's really a balance of trying to pick my battles. You know, you mentioned Michael Keaton and Batman. A thousand sites will be writing about that. So I probably won't write about that. What I would write about is something that's similar in tone of, hey, there's this little piece of news, but maybe not that many people are going to cover it. And, and I'll give you a perfect example uh, locally, a couple of weeks ago here, I, I rescanned my TV and this digital network pops up on the CBS station, which I'd never heard of. And so I, like anyone else, I go and Google, look at it. There's nothing about the, the, the network, not at all. And I finally find a little information about it that the CBS O&O stations have launched this thing. I watch it a little bit so I can figure out what they're, they're programming. And I write this little piece, and, and the digital network happened to be called Fave TV. So I wrote this piece called What is Faith TV? Because no one else was covering it, it was the number one thing you found when you went into Google at the time. And it just got a ton of traffic. And the thing with something like that is that I will also try and highlight some of my other stuff on that page so that people will maybe decide to to join my newsletter or, or to pay a little bit more attention to the site. And a lot of times my job is finding something which is fun. It's informative, but also 50 million other people aren't writing about it so that it'll kind of cut through the clutter. When obviously traffic comes from lots of different places, but when you do see rushes of traffic, where is it most often coming from? Is it Facebook? Is it Google? Um, Typically it is Google search engine um, involved. Sometimes it's Facebook it, once again, particularly because over the last couple of years, Facebook's changed their algorithms a lot. Unless you're paying for traffic, it's really tough to get steady traffic from them. And I typically, if I see traffic from Facebook, it's because someone just spontaneously posted something and it got attention. 
it's not something I focus on a lot. I, I bang for the buck. I get more out of Twitter as far as people sharing things and some of the other social media things. Um, a lot of it's search engine driven. And, and that really gets back to, you know, picking things that'll sort of cut through the clutter that, that Buzzfeed and Huffington Post and Slate and all the other sites aren't already covering. And I'm guessing you're mainly just using social media just to link to new articles. Like you're not doing, you're not creating a lot of original content outside of the website itself. No, no, I, you know, I, I'm played around a little bit with video and, and some other things, uh, but it really gets down to uh, a bang for your buck and just the amount of time I have in the day. Uh, I, in a better world, I'd like to do a, a regular podcast, but just, the amount that it would get me versus the amount of time I would spend on it for me isn't worth it at this point. It's I'd much rather take that time and, and write something. And it, it really is because of my business model. It It's a matter of numbers of trying to get as, as much readership as I can and, and hopefully steady reader, readership. Do you feel like having to produce that kind of output? Do you feel, feel any kind of burnout or anything like that or times where it kind of starts to stretch you thin? I mean, there are certainly times, you know, I took the last 10 days or so more or less off. Uh, I didn't write my newsletter. I have a daily uh, Monday through Friday newsletter I write. And I didn't write that for 10 days. I did minimal stuff on the website. I spent a lot of time just watching things and relaxing. And, and that definitely refreshed me a little bit. And there are days where I just... I, I sit down in front of the computer and just like, oh, man. But I, I really enjoy doing it. I, I've always been someone who enjoyed writing. To me, that's relaxing, which sounds really bizarre to a lot of people. Uh, you know, my, my wife does uh, puzzles to relax. And to me, that's too stressful. For me, I can sit down and write and t that's relaxing. And that definitely helps. Do you enjoy TV still? Like I, I edited this like podcast recommend recommendation newsletter for like a year and I eventually like stopped because it like took all the enjoyment out of listening to podcasts because I felt like I had to listen to so many, even ones I didn't even really like that much, just so I could be keep, kept abreast of it. And I f started falling behind on the ones I really liked and different stuff like that. And like turning that into a job kind of actually took some of the pleasure out of listening to podcasts. And I was, I felt really relieved when I finally closed down that newsletter. Do you ever feel that kind of dynamic at all? You know, it's funny. Um, I mean, sometimes I just will approach something and think, I really need to watch this. And I just really don't want to do it. It's not something I would normally watch. The The nice thing is sometimes I'm surprised in those scenarios, which always makes it worth it. The thing that's been hardest for me is I try to have a few shows, a few things that I watch just for me. And uh, a perfect example, that's this reality show called The Curse of Oak Island, which is this long running series about these guys trying to find this treasure in Nova Scotia. And I was just watching it as a sideline because it's historically kind of interesting. And I don't know, last year I decided one day, uh, you know what, I'm watching the same game, but let me just write a recap of it. I, I almost never write recaps of episodes and I wrote the recap and it just got an insane amount of traffic. And so I started writing these recaps of the show and it ruins my appreciation of the show. Uh-huh. You yeah, know, because like I've, heard about, I've heard about I've heard about the turn of the recap and how much it can just destroy. Uh, because, like, t talk a little bit about that. Because, like, are we still in the era of the recap? Because I remember, like, eight years ago, like back when I was watching Mad Men, I would sometimes read them, and there seemed to be a lot of them. Is that still kind of the mo for a lot of entertainment sites or news sites in general to just recap because there's just like this huge audience there, or is that has that waned at all? There's less recapping than you used to see. I mean. The streaming era has made it difficult because you see sites uh, still doing recaps of shows, even though all eight episodes drop the same day. Mm -hmm. And they do get traffic, not as much as they would have. It, it, it seems sort of pointless to me. Um, I feel like there are a lot of good podcasts that do it now. Like I, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a big fan of Succession, and I, even I don't really listen to recap stuff, but even I started kind of tuning into the Succession recap podcast because it is kind of fun to hear two people discuss the episode right after you've watched it. Yeah, and really, that the DNA of of a, a podcast like that really is the same DNA that really came out of the the era of recaps, that golden era back in when uh, people were following Dawson's Creek or, or, or one of those shows. And they would, people would write these, you know, 
eight thousand word recap of an episode. <laughs> it was just just insane things, and and but it really is a sort of the same DNA. Is it? You're hearing someone's voice. It's it's someone that uh, the recap is as interesting almost as the show itself, and that's a really hard thing to to pull off. And that's that's the problem you have with recaps or really anything like this is that. You know, whether you're talking about entertainment or politics or whatever kind of journalism, finding distinctive voices uh, is difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's talk about monetization. Like you mainly do programmatic display advertising, right? Yeah. And really, if if I was in my 20s and I had this website, I would approach it completely differently. Uh, I would be looking at it as, hey, this is maybe a business I can spin off and I'd bring in a couple of people and we would sell video ads and we'd load a bunch of stuff on the website. And, but I'm not looking at that. So to me, this is, this is my job. This will allow me to work as long as I want to. So all, what I'm really concerned about is generating enough money that, that it's a job, you know, that it pays a salary and, and I make decent money and make, make a living. And, and so I can do that with the amount of traffic I get just doing display ads. It, you don't make a lot per page, but if you have enough pages and my overall costs aren't very high, I mean, it's really just me and the occasional freelancer. I do really well this way. I, I don't know that it's something I would recommend for most people, but it, it, it is a good look for me. And how does that work for, from a solo practitioner? Like, are you just going to do, and I'm, and I would say one of my weaknesses is I don't know much about ad tech compared to, you know, someone who's really into that industry, but is it like shopping around for different networks that will, can offer you the best CPM and the, and the technology that's least likely to slow down your website? Like, what, what is that how it works for, for you? Yeah. You know, the problem with any of this programmatic stuff is that there isn't a lot of transparency. Um, you know, you don't know what you're going to make until after the fact. And because all of it's done behind this veil of, of technology, you're just trying to estimate as best you can. You know, I, like most people, start out using Google AdSense. I still have a, a decent amount of Google AdSense ads on the site. I have it set up so that I have some other networks that pay better. Uh, and they, I compare what those sites are offering me versus what Google's offering me. And it just automatically chooses the better rate. And it's all sort of done behind the scenes automatically. Uh, I have a target of, look, this is what I would like to make my, my RPM, my revenue per thousand pages. This is what I'm hoping to make. This is my target. And then that's as bad as granular as I get into it of paying attention to that and then trying to adjust it so that I'm always making that amount or more. Has the programmatic ad market gotten better or worse over the last several years? Like, do you feel like let's set aside the pandemic. So of course I'm sure you saw a dip around them, but like, I, I have a hard time getting a sense because like the way that publishers talk is that like it, they're, they're getting squeezed more and more. Do you feel like your revenue, your RPM, your revenue per thousand impressions has it stayed steady? Has it gotten better? Like what's, what's your feelings been? It uh, for me has been more or less steady. Like you said, the first half, especially of 2020 was, was brutal. It, it went down about 40% for me and that was pretty typical across the industry. But you know, if you were, for instance, a Buzzfeed, you can't make enough money with, with display ads. I mean, it's in a perfect world and it really just, it depends on the site. It depends on a lot of different situations, but assume you're making whatever, $6, a thousand pages. Well, that's $6,000 for a million pages. And, and that doesn't go very far if you're busy. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, if you're, if you're just me and you, you get two or three or 4, 000, million page views in a month, Hey, that's a pretty good living. Yeah. Um, but it, it's for most sites, for most media sites, the, it, it's just impossible to make money that way. And then you run into a situation of you're loading your site with all different kinds of stuff, trying to eke more money out of it. And it, it really is difficult. I read recently that entertainment sites have been kind of shielded somewhat because they're benefiting from the streaming bubble that like all these huge media and tech companies are spending billions of dollars a year on programming and on original programming. And b- because that they have pretty massive marketing budgets because they're so 
they're so focused on customer acquisition and a lot of that money has been going to uh, like, you know, entertainment websites. Has that been your experience? It's somewhat of a mixed bag, uh, particularly in the last year, all that money that used to be spent on advertising movies and, and different live experiences, all that stuff has went away. There is a lot of streaming money. The problem you run into, particularly the site my size, is that the tendency is for them to want to spend the money at big sites and getting to that point where you're a, a trusted enough site that they'll they'll dump some money onto you even automatically. It takes a while. I'm lucky because the site's been around so long that it has a pretty good reputation with the advertisers that I use, but it, it's definitely a challenge uh, just, just in general. I mean, there is a lot of money out there, but it's like any other industry that people are, are more comfortable spending it with big familiar sites than they are with smaller sites, which might be a better fit for their advertising. Uh, how do you feel like you compete with like the bigger entertainment sites? Like, do you feel like you're competing with them for scoops? Do they, do they throw you traffic? Do they credit you? What's your relationship there? Um, <laughs> you know, am I opening it's, a can of worms? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's funny. Uh, I was telling someone this the other day. It, it's, you know, I find just, just on Twitter, the, the people that I'm interacting with, Almost none of them are other TV critics. It's almost all streaming industry people. Um, some of the some of the major sites, some of the industry sites, uh, the editors and stuff. I'm I'm really close with. We you know we have a lot of interaction, but they typically just see me as a gnat to be brushed away. You know they have their own issues. I mean, the interesting thing is that you're seeing this consolidation of the entertainment trade sites, uh, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, Billboard, they're all coming under one company. And so they're trying frantically to figure out a way to make money. They've they've just been losing crazy amounts of money. Um, So they are almost too busy focusing on that to focus on what other people are doing, which works out for me. And it's also, they can't, because they're they're concerned about money because they have limited resources even though they've got you know a staff of 50 or 60 or 70 people uh, there are a lot of things that they just can't justify covering and that's that's a perfect niche for me i mean if if a show has a, a million vis, a million viewers that might not be enough for a hollywood reporter to care but that's enough people who are going to be looking for coverage of that show that I can make a really good living covering. And that's really been my attitude. I sort of ignore what everyone else is doing. Look at what, what are those spots in there that other people don't care about or, or the other people, you know, it's, it's programming that people sort of shrug off, laugh off, but there's, there's viewers for it. That that's, that's money to be made. It's almost like uh, uh, whole foods, you know, whole foods doesn't, uh, doesn't sell everything. Doesn't, carry everything but the people who are looking for those organic bananas will go to whole foods and pay extra because they know that's where they can find it and and that's kind of my attitude overall and is it is your advertising is 100 percent programmatic if someone approached you and said i want to sponsor your site would you be able to handle that or is that not even worth your time i've done some sponsorships like that i will occasionally have uh, situations where Either someone takes over the whole front page, uh, you know, with one of those really big takeover ads or sponsored posts of some sort or some kind of partnerships. I I do get some of that stuff. Um, Really, it gets down to a a case by case basis. Sometimes what they want to do, I don't feel comfortable with editorially. Uh, sometimes it's just not worth the money for what they're talking about. But I have done that before, and I, I'm, I'm certainly open to doing that stuff. Uh, it's mostly stuff that just comes along. And as far as uh, soliciting it, you almost have to have a dedicated salesperson to do that. And I'm just not in that situation. And you don't want to partner with someone, pay to mom commission or something like that to help you build that business? Um, you know, I've looked into it. And you know, part of the the issue with that is that for someone to, who's really good at it, they can go work for a really big company where they'll make tons of money. And, you know, for them to 
feed a few things to me really isn't worth it for them, which I, I totally get. You could position it as a startup and give them equity or make them a business partner. I don't know, but maybe that's not worth it to you. Well, yeah. I mean, part of my thing is I like the idea of being the only person. Mm-hmm. You know, I like it's. I like the idea of it. It's just me and I don't have to justify you know, why did you cover this thing or why did you spend this money or whatever? It's, it's, it's really freeing in a way after working for all these different companies that were either startups that didn't know what they were doing or, or big media companies that were just so bureaucratically worn down. It, it's really nice to be in a situation of, of being a, a lone wolf. I mean, there's definitely disadvantages, but it's nice not having to justify your decisions to anybody. Do uh, do all the streaming services or do they have any kind of referral codes where you can get like if, if you're writing about a show and they click on your link and sign up for HBO Max, you get a cut of that or is that not part of your strategy? Uh, it's not really part of my strategy. As some of them do. Some of them don't. Um, you know, I've tried some of that stuff in the past. Typically, the your success rate isn't very high. And for what I was getting, I just I felt uncomfortable writing about a show and then saying, "Hey, if if you like HBO Max, click this thing and, and I'll get a little bit of money out of it." I mean, I, I've been very uh, hands off about that stuff, probably to a fault. And, and one of the alterations I'm making going into 2021 is just at least giving people an option to donate a little money to the site if they want to. Just uh, because I, I don't want to get into a subscription model, even with my newsletter, I, you know, I don't want it to turn into a subscription deal. I will. I think I get a lot of coverage having a, a free newsletter people can pass around. But I do get people pretty frequently saying, hey, look, I would pay for this or is there a way I can support you directly? And, and I want to make that possible because I, I think that that's that's a good option that doesn't get into any sort of editorial issues you know i i like the idea of if if i hate a show being able to say hey i hate a show and not have to worry about the advertiser ramifications of it with the newsletter are you publishing anything in a newsletter that doesn't appear on the site or is it just linking to articles on your site uh it is almost entirely different than the site which is not really the way that i had planned it but what it's turned into essentially is um a monday through friday newsletter there's generally some links to outside stuff that are jumping off points for, for me to write about, say, oh, Bloomberg wrote about this. This is why I think this is important. This is why I don't think it's important. And then there's some daily listings at the bottom. It's very different than what you'll see on the, the news on the website. Um, the, the readership of it, based on people's email addresses and, and the feedback I get, is very industry centric, much more so than the website. It's almost a different audience, which I, I guess is good. I, I, I haven't quite decided if that's a good thing or not. I do link to stuff that's on the website and I can see what people click through. So they are clicking through to the website. Um, but the newsletter gets a, a pretty good open rate, you know, so I, I, people are reading it. Uh, it has helped the website a little bit, but it's it's definitely almost a different business. So it seems like, you know, because it's kind of a numbers game, it sounds like there's a lot of drive by traffic. How, like, what about your core? Do you have a do you feel like you have a core loyal audience? Like, are there Rick Ellis fans out there? Are you kind of like well known within like certain industry folks? Like what's kind of your sense of like loyal audience as a subset of, you know, those drive by audience who are coming in through Google and Facebook and stuff like that? Well, you know, I can look at the amount of people who visit the website on a regular basis. And, you know, there's about 20, 25 percent of the people who are visiting multiple, multiple times a month. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, more than five times a month, which for a website is is pretty good. Yeah, (laughs) That's, that's a really good rate. So I would I guess I would consider those people, quote, fans of the site, or at least that means I'm in their regular rotation. Um, I mean, it's always a struggle, no matter how big your site is to get people visiting on a regular basis. And hopefully some of those people that you, that come in through search will stay for whatever reason. And it seems to be the case that as my overall traffic has grown, the, the percentage of people who keep coming back regularly has also grown or, or stayed the same percentage. So I, I, I'm more people are coming in, but 
more people are staying. So I, I would guess that's a success. Do you have any strategies for interacting with your audience? Like, are you trying to build any sense of community? You know, I, uh, in earlier days I was doing, you know, comments and that kind of stuff. And it just, it primarily turned into a nightmare. I mean, it, it was really, it took a lot of time. There's just tons of spam. Um, and, and, you know, when you look at a lot of the bigger sites, they're, their comment sections have a lot of spam and they just don't bother dealing with it. And so I have not, I basically shut all that stuff off. I get, I do a lot of interaction with people on social media. I do a lot. I get a lot of, of emails from people, a lot of contacts that way. Um, but as far as like, you know, doing comments on the site or that kind of thing, I really haven't just because I, I found that the value for readers isn't very high and the aggravation for me is pretty high as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, Rick. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me at allyourscreens.com. It's it's pretty much the way you uh, hear it, A-L-L-Y-O-U-R, screens.com. My email is rick at allyourscreens.com if you do want to reach out, or on Twitter, it's A-Y-S Rick. Awesome. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks. Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.